You are welcome to Ogidi One GH. God bless you for tuning in. Today we trust God that today's service at my meeting will be a blessed one for you. We have a package because there's a man of God the Lord has blessed his church with. And I believe that as we introduce him to our viewers, the Lord will use him to be a blessing to you. Tune in and, and, and relax. But I know that it will be a blessing. God bless you. Today we are blessed to have his eminence the Archbishop Van Dyke Noah with us. He's a man the Lord has used to be a blessing to many people here on earth. In fact, for those of you who've spent their life in USA, I've heard a lot about this great man of God. He has a church in Minneapolis, uh, Minnesota, and other branches all over the United States and Africa and the Europe. Asia and other places. We will give him time to introduce himself well. But with that much ado, I want us to all welcome His Eminence, the Archbishop Van Dyke Noah. God bless you, sir. God, God bless you. God bless you. We thank you for making time to visit our studio today. Uh, we would love that you introduce yourself to our viewers so that they will know who His Eminence is. Well, thank you very much, Bishop. Um, I'm extremely happy to be here today. Uh, first and foremost, I just want to recommend this page uh, that Tune In is a good platform uh, that the Word of God is being preached. And most especially, you can have exciting items that will refresh your day. So I recommend this page for you. But somebody might ask, who is Archbishop Van Dyke Noah? Uh, Archbishop Van Dyke Noah is originally from Ghana. I'm born in, I'm born in, I'm, uh, I came from Ghana, migrated to Israel, and migrated to United States of America. I'm the founder and the leader of Miracle Redemption Christian Center International, with the headquarters in Israel, not Minnesota. Oh, the I headquarters see. is in Israel, but uh, we have branches all over the world. Now let me tabulate some of the branches branches that we have. We have Minnesota where I reside. We have Israel. We have seven churches in Liberia. We have five churches in Ghana here. We have uh, two churches in Philippines. We have one church in India. We have Zanzibar, we have Malawi, and we have nine churches in Fiji Islands, getting to Australia. And so this is in a nutshell, uh, Archbishop Van Dyke. Wow, wow. Thank God for what he has been using you to do. Uh, a little bit that you also love that you emulate is your family life. Mm. I think it's something you omitted. I don't know if there is anything like a family that the well, Archbishop have? Well, I have married for almost 32 years. Wow. I met my wife and we married in Israel. Mm. God has blessed us with one beautiful daughter. And uh, both of them are with me in the United States of America, Minnesota, to, to be precise. And so I am from, I am the, the third born of four, mm. uh, two, uh, two girls, two boys. Okay. And my mom is one, 101, still alive. Hallelujah. And so we are a very welcoming family. And uh, we are together. Praise God. Brothers and sisters. Yeah. Praise God. We thank God so much for uh, this blessing. I know Mama uh, Ruby and the, the, the beautiful Ella. I have met them once when I came to Minneapolis, so I thank God for having you having such an awesome family. Uh, a little bit about your academics. Uh, the reason why I'm bringing the academics here is uh, the present day believers, men of God, take light academic or preparation, academic preparation towards ministry. Mm. And I would like you to enumerate on your academic credentials if there are any. Uh, well, um, as, as Ghanaians, I schooled in uh, Fidium, mm -hmm. 
I, I have four. Mm. That's where I did my primary. And from there, I went to seminary, St. Mm. James Seminary. Mm. I learned that it's one of the uh, best uh, schools so. in Ghana here. We, we were the uh, pioneers who started St. James Seminary. Mm. From there, I came to St. Hubert Seminary at the back of Opokuwa. And then from there, I migrated to uh, Israel and I went to King of Kings Bible College mm. in Jerusalem. And there, that's where I did the BA. Mm. And from there also I did uh, a little Hebrew interpretation. Mm. Then I migrated to United States of America. Then from there uh, I started ministry and I was awarded the PhD, honorable PhD mm. in theology and in psychology. Wow. So academically uh, that's formed the foundation of my my ministry. Uh, okay. And I said that uh, I learned you study something about immigration law also. Oh yes, uh, I went to uh, United States, I went to school. You know, I went to United States to work and study mm. and do ministry. Mm. Uh, I call it the trapeze vision. <laughs> uh, work, ministry, and uh, build life for myself. So mm. when I went, one of the things that I love doing is to help people. Mm. So I went to uh, school. Mm. I did a course in immigration mm, whereby way. I file for people for citizenship. Wow. I file for people to bring people from Africa to join their family oh, members. Wow. And so, uh, I am known in Minnesota cycle for that. And Praise I still God. do it up to today. Praise God. Praise God. I think it's a very laudable information for our friends in the United States so that if you are over there and you are believing God to have somebody who supports you, have your documentations done, citizenship done, you can contact His Eminence and it will be a blessing unto you. And what there's something you said that I really love. You see, uh, people actually think if you are in ministry, there's no need to go through any social course or do any other course but as you said you did something that is outside ministry mm -hmm. but god is using that same thing to be a blessing to people of god in the church well it's very very important for the pastors mm. who tune in to understand this mm. that society is dynamic, dynamic. Change. Yeah. okay uh when i was growing up it was very easy for people to just go to farm mm. and bring cassava mm. and bring all those food items mm. and bring it to the the priest mm. nowadays things have changed okay. a little bit average offering mm. then was higher than average offering now no why because people have evolved and so if you're doing ministry and your concentration on the traditional way of income, tithe and offering, you cannot do much. Mm. So you can use your certificates, what you have gone to school for, add it up to the ministry. Anybody who tells you that working and doing ministry does not work together, it's deceiving you. Mm. You can work and at the same time do effective ministry. But let, let me bring All what you need is discipline. Well, let me bring in this word, full time. Full time. You see, uh, when we came to ministry, there was this thing, they would say, you, you have to do full time ministry. Full time ministry. Uh, is this something, is it a myth or is this something that uh, is, is, is out of ignorance? Because, uh, let me chip with this word, I am a man of God, somebody blesses me with a huge sum of amount. Mm -hmm. Should I eat all that money, stay home, and use all that money in my house? Or can I invest and make more money out of it? Uh, Number two, let me say, I did BA in uh, management. Uh, I may be able to use my certificate to advance my course or help people with my knowledge. Mm -hmm. Is it bad to step into the secular world and also make a good use of my academic intelligence or is this because God has called me I don't have to do any other job but to commit myself to uh, church and be be, 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 be be vulnerable to the offerings <laughs> that the concept of the kingdom of God is broad mm. and that is why most people don't understand when we say the kingdom of God 
is not only church or church in him. Church is, let's say, 10% mm. of the kingdom of God. Mm. Like somebody having an orphanage is part of the kingdom. kingdom. Somebody also, God will endow with the good business so that the proceeds can help mm. the development of the church. Mm. I have seen so many churches that also goes into mechanized farming. farming. Then the proceeds also will help. So when a church is doing farming, it's work. When a man of God is doing farming or doing investment, it's work. Mm. Now what is the definition of work? Anything that you do that will bring income mm. is considered as work. Mm. So if you are a man of God and even you build real estate, mm. you are working. You are working. So the concept of full time is non and void. Mm. So my thing is anything that God has blessed you with, if it can add up to what you do in ministry. It's acceptable. Mm. Do it faithfully, do it honestly, and do it with excitement mm. for the betterment of the kingdom of God. I understand that perfectly. Because I remember when God called Moses, mm -hmm. he was a shepherd, and Moses was using a staff. In fact, God did not tell Moses to throw away his staff. Oh, yeah. The staff that represents his profession, in fact, he rather used the staff to shepherd his people Israel. Now uh, let, let me chip in. Mm. Uh, uh, when you study Christology mm. and uh, we come to the lifestyle of Jesus, mm. it is the silent part. Mm. But Jesus commenced his ministry when he was at 30 years. Yes. Now, from 12, in the Jewish mysticism, mm. when somebody is 12 years, he's considered as a man. Okay. Okay. Bar mitzvah. Mm. So, from 12 years to 30 years, Jesus was actively working as a carpenter. Carpenter. He was working. Mm. He was working with Joseph. Mm. His father. So, his father. So, when Jesus moved into ministry, some of the basic items that he needed for ministry, he already had them. He had already them. But I was even checking the disciples. You could, you could see that almost all of them were doing something profitable. Exactly. And none of them was feeble. None of them was financially broke. I think one of them, is it Levi? The Bible said he even hosted some ministers in his house when he was having a party. Exactly. So and I, that is the reason why it is very imperative for now church to understand that. When you are a minister or you are a pastor, Regardless of the position that God has called you, mm -hmm. it does not negate you to actively involve in a secular world secular and world. work. And I see a problem here. The problem is because the traditional way of income for the churches have diminished. Mm -hmm. Most pastors are burning out because mm -hmm. they can't get enough money to cater for themselves and cater for the church. So we resort to, all of us, to certain dishonest way mm. of making money. And meanwhile, that pastor is holding PhD, mm. he's holding master's degree. That he can do something to supplement the ministry. Mm. But, the, but the full time conception. The full time the perception. That, perception. Oh, you, are, you have to do full time. You have to give your all to God. Uh, I think that is something that is deceiving all of us. Oh, yes. Giving your all to God means stay in the church. So, even if I can do something, they say, oh, in a mini part, dear. In a mini part, go give your all to God. And so, and, and sometimes, even our society is also, that doesn't help us. You are a man of God and you go in to do something. Or suffer the way, Macy, or a carpenter, or suffer the way, Breach and Juma. So, 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 sometimes that is some of the challenges we have. So, it, it makes it difficult for you to step in and say, well, uh, yes, I'm a man of God, but I have to feed my children. My children must eat. And so, therefore, I need not to be a burden to my church. I think the society sometimes also makes it let's, a burden. let's go to uh, the, the, uh, the creation narrative. God, who is so great and mighty, powerful, started creating. Mm -hmm. And Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, coming. Every day, God was doing something different. Mm -hmm. And the Bible said this was the first day, the second day. 
and you realize that 24 hours God will do something and rest and continue doing something extra the concept of 24 hours is very very important in life God wants us to use eight hours to work in a civilized world people go to work eight hours and if you study and you upgrade yourself you can work eight hours successfully and you can live very good mm. God wants you to rest this body he has given to us rest eight hours so that you can get nourishment to continue mm. the following day because the body will burn out mm. so he he commands darkness to come so that whether you like it or not you have to go sleep after eight hours god wants us to use another eight hours to worship him mm. which makes it 24 hours eight hours to work eight, eight hours, hours to rest, rest and eight, eight hours, hours to worship, wow. to worship. then it will end up 24. so if i use my eight hours can we can we phantom a man of god who is exhausting all the eight hours a day mm. for worship no oh. we might be fooling ourselves mm. do you actively engage yourself in ministry for eight hours no no the highest might be four hours let's say four hours. four four hours so you can use the other four hours for something Don't else this. i go to my office I study my Bible, I pray, I do what I do my counseling. The rest of the hours I do immigration stuff, mm. make some few dollars, mm. add it up to what the church will give me. Continue life. You you made a statement about you made a statement about the contemporary church and our challenges. Yes. When we were young, the the the, the only instrument that was in the church was the conka. Yeah. So so the pastors were not paying instrumentalists. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> you don't pay instrumentalists, you, you have a gun car and then the the don't don't the gun gun I mean this one, the small one that they put on their armpit. So those days there weren't any challenges, more challenges in the church. Now you are paying the media, you are paying instrumentalists. So the little money that comes to the church, you know, if that's all you are going to live, I mean live on, you, you'll be disappointed. So what you are saying is very important. But you chip in a word about sleeping. I know that you wrote a book about the mystery of sleeping. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and and uh, sometimes uh, when you talk to young preachers, they think uh, if somebody sleeps and is, I mean he's doing something bad, others do think that motivational speakers say oh, we don't sleep, we don't sleep. But you, you talked about the mystery of sleeping. And today too you are talking about the importance of at least having eight hours sleep. Is that something that men and people must know? That we are taking, we are not taking good care of our mind. We are not considering the the, 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 the creation narrative uh, arrested this point very clearly, and God rested. rested. How can you interpret it? Uh, this unseen God, mm. who is a spirit, mm. resting, mm. and if God deems deems it expedient mm. to rest. Mm. What about you, human mm, being? Mm. And the Bible says we are being created in the image and likeness of God. So if God is resting, that is imperative. You are not a machine. You are flesh and blood. To rest. Adequate rest will nourish your brains. Will nourish your body. So that when you begin your day, you are refreshed to continue. But let me chip in. You talk about the mystery of sleeping mm. i wrote that book extensively mm. if you need a copy you can go to my website mm. mrcci.org or van dyke archbishop van dyke noah.org and you can uh, order a copy uh, by by the way i've written uh, nine books mm. uh, the first book is uh, exposing demonic operation the second book is marriage fix the third book is The Mystery of Sleeping, what we're talking about. I've also written, uh, written Money Begot Money, uh, Prayer the Hidden Falls, uh, Decoding an African Mind, mm -hmm. The Theology of the Bible. But with all these books that God has helped me to write, the best one that I love is Decoding an African Mind. Mm -hmm. And that is exactly what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Until the church take the theology 
and apply it and decode certain misconceptions from our minds, we'll be cut off. We'll be cut off. And I'm not a prophet of doom, but I'm a Pentecostal mm -hmm. a preacher. And what I forecast is if something drastic uh, do not happen to the church, or what I call the paradigm shift, then the next 15, 20 years, we will see mass exodus from mm. Pentecostalism. But to Orthodox churches. To, to the Orthodox churches. Because uh, what we are doing in Pentecostalism is not working anymore. Mm. People are not attracted. People are not attracted to Pentecostalism now that it used to be. Mm. So all of us, we need to have our theology right. Mm. And we need to understand uh, the now check. So we can take the theology of yesterday, apply it today, but we have to use wisdom. wisdom. That people are evolving. evolving. People are more educated. People are more smarter than the way we started when we started preaching so so as you said the rest is important mm -hmm. and I, 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 the reason why i wanted to chip in that rest thing was, Papa, is i called one of my pastors i saw him in a way i didn't like he's one of the prophets and i called him i said i i don't think you are aware they say hmm. i've been taking some medications to keep me awake they say, why? You see, Pastor, after service, people will come for counseling, people will do that so, and then after that, I go to fasting, and I go to all night, and I go to the, 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 the deliverance, and I say, no, you. So I discovered that he was taking some, something, some drug, to keep him awake all the time, so that he can meet all those with needs. And I told him, this, uh, this is going to affect you at the long run, because you are, you are overstressing your body. Yes, the people, sometimes if you're not careful, like Jethro told Moses, the crowd, when they come, and you're not careful how to handle yourself, the crowd will kill you before you are tired. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I really appreciate the words. Let rest me, when you let me uh, chip in this uh, with my own personal experience. Mm -hmm. When I migrated from uh, uh, Israel to United States, mm -hmm. I went there with 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 a vision and with a determination that by who crook I have to succeed. Mm. I was pregnant with vision mm. and I was determined to make life by who crook. That was my mindset. Now one of the things that I forgot uh, that I am a body, I mm. have a body, mm. I have a spirit, and I have a soul. Mm. And my body needs to rest. Yes. So I will go to secular work in the, in, the, in the night from 10 to 7. Continue from 7 from another job to 4.30. Mm. I will do that from Sunday night to Thursday mm. evening, double. Then I use Friday for all night, Saturday for all night, and Sunday for church service. So my body was not resting. Mm. I was standing near a bus before I realized, boom, I was on the floor. Mm. Without even me having an, an iota of feelings that maybe this part of my body is sick or mm. that i just fell down i got up and i saw that the whole world was turning like mm. that now thank god we have we, we we have a medical doctor in our in our church so i the following day i went to his practice and i said ah, this is like my my um i'm feeling dizzy mm. he checked and my pressure has gone way past 250. Mm. And when he did the EKG, he realized that my heartbeat was abnormal. Instantly, they called the ambulance and they took me to a big hospital. Mm -hmm. And when I went, six doctors came because they, everybody knew that a young boy like me, I was getting a heart attack. Mm -hmm. 
It took an Indian doctor who came and saw the chart and were able to study and, and uh, comforted me that, no, his pressure has been so high for a long time mm. without being checked. And that's why the heart is behaving like that. God, initially they thought I was getting a heart attack because of the EKG. So instantly they gave me uh, 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 pressure pills and uh, gave me a uh, drip to calm and ease the pressure. So all what I'm trying to say is, you are a human being. A human being. You need to rest. Yes. The only thing that you, the yardstick by which we measure all these things is, Discipline. Discipline. Discipline yourself to the point whereby, whether you are a pastor, regardless of what you do for a living, rest is paramount. Rest is paramount. You need to rest from time to time. If not, you can make life and you will not live to enjoy. We read uh, um, Ecclesiastes chapter number 5, verse 19. The Bible says, if God gives you wealth, and enables you to enjoy mm, mm, mm. itself is a blessing. Yes, a blessing. Then you continue from Ecclesiastes chapter 6, verse 1. That there are some people that God bless them to get the wealth, mm. but He does not enable them to enjoy. How? Because people don't take care, of their, uh, take care of their bodies. So they make money and they die young and they leave the wealth, wealth behind. Archbishop, this is a very deep statement. A very deep statement. I think it is something very important for our generation that matters we are all working hard making money if you if you lose your strength you've lost it all if you lose your strength you've lost it all so it is imperative there's something that we talk about about encoding or affecting the men the mental faculty of the african mind decoding or decoding the african mind <laughs> it's a very deep statement but you see some of us are from royal families mm -hmm. and then when you come to church uh, the church says that uh, you can't go back to royalty because the, there's this kind of they've married our traditional religion to chieftaincy. Mm -hmm. So let me say I have a church member who steps into church, but he's a royal who needs to sit on the seat of his uncle or mother as a queen. But because of this issue, this African way of handling things. Uh, the person says, Papa, what do I do? Do I step in? And if I don't step into it, but this is the problem here. Uh, let me, maybe I have to give you uh, what is happening by, uh, what do you call it, uh, current issues on the ground. So for chiefs, when they occupy the chieftaincy position, they will sell the lands, but you hardly see any development from the chiefs. They care less about even the road they have sold you the land, but the road to the land they care less. Now the church is also not motivating Christians to enter into chieftaincy. <laughs> so should we always leave our chieftaincy positions to other people who we know, but when they take control of the leadership, they are going to be so selfish, they are not going to ensure that development prevail in our communities. This is something that I want you to help us. Since you have been there, you know much about the African mentality. But how do we handle this issue? Well, I 100% I respect chieftaincy as an institution. I believe in chieftaincy and I applaud them. And when you come to biblical accounts, we have to understand that chieftaincy was instituted by God. Mm -hmm. um, the, the Jewish culture and tradition uh, outdates uh, most Western civilization, mm -hmm. and most especially Africans. Mm -hmm. Now, it's God who brought Davidic dynasty, mm -hmm. and he picked Saul to be the first king of Israel, then David came and he continued. Now, so chieftaincy has been sanctioned by God. Mm. Let's give them that credit. Mm. The, the most important thing that all of us, including our chiefs and every leader in this country, have to understand is to use your position 
not to enrich yourself but use your position as a better man for society because the position that God has given to us certainly we will give an account for our stewardship mm. as an archbishop if I use my title to enrich myself in the detriment of the people then I am leading dishonestly mm. now all truth are parallel if a chief sells the land the proceeds come we are not attacking his position no but the mindset of the chief has to be the land was given to us by god mm. so the Levit leviticus 25 says the land shouldn't be sold permanently because the land is mine mm. so god create a chief came and met the land so god created the land so if you sell it use part to govern the palace mm. but some percentage has to go to the community whereby you make the rules mm -hmm. and if we the born again christian also will understand that being a chief mm. has nothing to do with your religiosity mm -hmm. then it will attract most of these young world able minded people to enter into chieftaincy now when i was growing up you hear about chiefs and you all what you think so the appalling labation, labation. they are doing all these occultic things mm -hmm. so nobody wants to be mm -hmm. but it shouldn't be case if god has called you to be a chief when the vacancy comes please i will i, I will entreat you to jump into it when you go you can change the dynamism of it and allow god to live and that is what we need both in our local government in our our uh, uh, presidency our and, politics. and in our politics we have to elect god fearing people people who are not hungry mm. for yourself but people who have decoded their mind that i'm getting this position not for myself but i'm getting this position for the people Hello. when you have that mindset and i think it's it's very very sad that africa as a whole we don't have that mindset mm. that compelled me to write the book the decoding an african mind mm. now let me use a common example that i see a kufuado lives in accra mm. right our our president mm. he lives in accra mm. he lives in a, a government mansion right mm. Mm. that place is is glassy nice kept and everything is fine right good most ministers live like that they, they don't live in Abu Burushi. Mm -hmm. They don't live in uh, uh, Kumasi Central. Mm -hmm. Right? Okay. So, if you throw, listen to me, you throw bottle on the gutter and it's choked, guess why? It's not the politicians. No. That when it rains, uh, no their, their items are going to be flooded. It's you. Now, indirectly, you are the cause. It's not a politician. So you can blame the politician, but it's not a void. It does not go anywhere. You are just talking and you're wasting your saliva. So until we decode our mind, now government has spent millions of dollars and has made uh, what uh, grass, grasses so that it will beautify the streets, mm -hmm. planted uh, flowers, as Western World, United States, and they have done. Those are the the route whereby those who are parading on the street they pass through to sell. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, the government has spent millions, millions. in fixing those grasses, beautification of the beautification of the street, and we are walking through it, destroying. It. Then we go back and said, okay, we are not going to vote for them because the economy is bad. Because the government have to take back the money and reinvest in the very thing that you are working on it and destroying it the gutter you are throwing things inside the government has to take your taxes mm. and distill it so it's a mindset mindset it's a mindset mm. where 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 i am when there's a green grass it's hardly for you to see a white person walking on the green grass they don't do it people don't throw things you leave things in your car and when you are cleaning the car, you put it in the gas bin. Mm -hmm. So, Africa needs to decode our mind. mindset. Mindset. People.
people go to jobs and all what they are looking for is an opportunity to steal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. People are going to work and Sunday they go to church and they are worshiping, they are doing this, they are doing that, they are doing that. But they don't know that stealing government time is stealing. stealing. So somebody who goes to use a gun to steal from somebody and you stealing from the people that you deserve to, you need to serve them. You are also stealing. So in the sight of God, now, what is, your are autists. But let me say this thing. That, you see, the African mentality, I like that statement you made. The African mindset where we, we want to mess up things and find somebody to blame. We will throw that beans. We will kill. One time I was in my house and it was raining. Uh, there's a river around my end. I was watching. It was about 1 o'clock a.m. I saw like a canoe coming. Hmm. One AMO. That's E. A canoe is coming. Where well, this, this infantis have located my house. So I thought the infantis have located my house and they're coming to visit me with the canoe. <laughs> well, before I ran, when the canoe was coming, I saw this white canoe. But, but when it came closer, it was a deep freezer. Now somebody has dropped a deep freezer, a, a, a spoiled deep freezer, in the rains. Now, this diffuser will be going somewhere at a place it can't go anymore. It will go short. short. And then there will be flood. And then we will turn to blame the politicians. So we create the mess in Africa, we create the mess and we blame the politicians. We are, the, the, the politicians have their part to, to be. I believe that this, this show that we are doing, I, I, I don't, take it, don't take it as an offense, mm -hmm. but take it as an intuition, education, that all of us, all of us, when we talk about a country building, we need all players, including mm -hmm. the citizenry, to participate. Now, one example that I find it very, when I was coming, my taxes for my, my house was due. I had to pay property tax. If I don't pay, the government will take it and auction it. Mm. You are talking of rebuilding this great country that all of us loved, and you don't pay taxes. No, we're talking about that. And you go problem. to church and you lift up your hands, and you are worshiping, and you are a pastor also, and you are prophesying. God have mercy on all of us. You understand what I mean? We want we want Africa to be like Europe, but we don't want to do what we the Europeans are doing. We have to do our part. <laughs> Pay your taxes. When you see a gutter, don't throw things. Mm -hmm. And if you see things in a gutter, just go distill it. Take it out. Mm -hmm. That is what we call patriotism. Mm -hmm. And so that book, the next time I'm coming, I'll bring a, a whole container of it. <laughs> we'll and and I, will, I will distribute for we'll, every we'll Ghanaian. Really distribute for every Ghanaian, from the politicians down to the common man on the street. Mm. So that all of us will get a copy and read. So mm. we have to decode the way we think, mm. our perceptions of life, and the way we act as, as pastors, as, as government officials, and as sitting there. Mm. If we all decode our mind and we look at this country, I think that the next 10 years we can uh, reshape Ghana and Ghana will be a big of hope. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yes, yes. I, I'm really enjoying this uh, conversation and I wish we could have gone on and on and on and on. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but time will not be on our side. We are even privileged to have his Ebenez I waste his time, with, or spend his time, let me use that word, with us today. Uh, is there any word you want to give to the body of Christ? Is there anything you think the church must know? And then lastly, is there anything the states, and I want to say the states here, the Ghanaian states must adhere to, that in your candid opinion will, re, will help shape our church and our states? Let me begin from uh, the latter. Ghanaians must first love their country. Mm. Because you can have citizenship of another country. Mm. You are still a Ghanaian. You are still a Ghanaian. A Ghanaian is a Ghanaian. I did not choose to be born in Ghana. It's a choice. It's divinely chosen for me. God, in his infinite knowledge and wisdom, decided that I am going to be a Ghanaian. It's above me. 
And so he gave me a Ghanaian father, he gave me a Ghanaian mother, and I was born on this land. So every Ghanaian must love our country. Whether the country is good, whether the country is bad, this is ours. This is ours. Okay. Now, it starts from there. When you love your country, then you want to see it uh, uh, to become better. Mm. That's the second, the second thing is, I think the church has a role to play. Because we lead the masses of the people with education. Now, the theology of God is going to do it. God mm. is going to do it. God, mm. I believe in miracles. I, I have seen countless of signs and wonders in my ministry. But the idea that God is sitting somewhere else and he's going to do everything for us mm. is erroneous. God has given us abilities, talents, capabilities that we have to tap into that and better our environment. Mm. Now, it's the church that has to take the theology mm. and educate. So now, I am loving teaching ministry more mm. than the so-called prophetic and uh, uh, miracles uh, services. Because in Ghana, what people need is not miracles. Mm -hmm. They need a miracle in their mindsets. And it will come as a result of teaching that we teach them how to live how to live honestly mm -hmm. we teach the church teach the politicians how to be honest and it is the mandate of the church to educate biblically the community how we all need to love this country mm -hmm. and serve this country for mother ghana to become what God wants it to be. So I pause here and uh, uh, I just want you to understand that we all have a role. Have a role. We have a role. And as you are listening, you might be the next minister. Possibly you might be the next president. Possibly you might be the next chief in your community. The next teacher the next lawyer, the next business person, the yardstick by which we can measure all ourselves is integrity with honesty. And when we are honest to ourselves and we live with integrity, then I believe that uh, Ghana can be a better place. Hallelujah. So I, I pray that all of us will decode our minds and come together with a sense of with a sense of purpose that we are building Ghana we are building the church especially the church we are building when you go to church go with a mindset of you are going to help to add up to the church it's not only the responsibility of the pastor, pastor. or the prophet to stand and display you also have a mandate given to you by God to play your part so that the church or the state can be better. God bless you and I love you. Hallelujah. Papa, on that, on that note, we want to say God bless you for having time to talk to us. Uh, viewers, God bless you all. We will uh, give you the numbers and the email of his eminence. So whoever wants to contact him can go to his website and then communicate with him. He's a lovely father and I believe that whatever is a burden in your life as you contact him, the Lord will use him to be a blessing. But lastly, I want you to pray for our viewers over the world that if anybody is going through any kind of stress, depression or sickness, uh, may the Lord heal those people through your prayers. Okay, stretch off your hands if you have faith. And believe that this good God, who is not confined only in heaven, but lives in the waves, will be able to attach you wherever you are. Father, in the name that is above every other name, Jesus, the Son of the living God, I release virtue that anybody who is hearing the sound of my voice, who is sick, I command that disease. To leave that body in the name of Jesus. Lord, I pray. 
Lift up your people, especially those who have tuned in. Cause them, O oh God, to live like a tree planted near a river, that they will bear their fruit in every season. I pause, O oh God, and pray for our country, Ghana. Lord, make this country the way you want this country to be. Let your kingdom come as it is in heaven. That together, O oh God, all of us will have a sense of building. That we will build this country, not for ourselves, for generations to come. This we ask in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. God bless you all. See you another time. Bye-bye for now.